Hi everybody, hope you're doing marvellously well. It's been a couple of weeks, but we're big, we're bad, and we're back with another Fac Friday. So I hope you're all doing marvellously well. I'm quite excited. Uh, it's been a really great week. We got to interview uh, Leland Sklar on Tuesday and then put it up on Wednesday. It was like a a no-brainer. Leland is an absolutely wonderful guy. If you check out his channel, you'll love it. You'll absolutely love it. Please check out the video. He did as well. And it's been fun. We've done a lot of different tips. We have a new one coming up on Monday. But of course, today being Friday, it is our Frequently Asked Questions Friday. So let's get stuck in. Oh, if you haven't already, please subscribe, hit the notification bell, and of course you can go to producelikeapro.com, sign up for the email list, get a whole bunch of free goodies, and of course, if you want, you can join our wonderful community, the Produce Like A Pro Academy, where I will be on Friday morning listening to your mixes. I've been a sound engineer for over 20 years, mostly live, but I still wonder how mixing on mastering engineers gets some productions so loud. I recently compared a production to some very loud American productions, and even if I use all the tools I have, such as multiband compressions and limiters, I can't get the production that loud without them really starting to pump. When I first started mixing, I felt exactly the same way, even back in the 90s. And I didn't realize just how many stages of compression and parallel and all kinds of other stuff that was going on. I would pull up my multi-tracks, whether it be on tape, ADATs, you know, this is pre-digital. And I'd pull them up and I would try to mix it. I would have some outboard compression, but I'd be mixing through inexpensive consoles. I'd have a limited amount of EQs and stuff like that. And I could never get it to sound quote unquote professional. I couldn't get that mid-90s Tom Lord algae, you know, super loud, slamming SSL sound that he had in those days. Tom, if you remember in America, in the mid-90s was everywhere. All modern rock was mixed by Tom Lord algae. What I didn't know until I worked with Tom as an artist, just how much other stuff was going on. First of all, on his SSL, there was multiple levels of compression. Each channel was being compressed. And then there was inserted other compressors. Now, a lot of them weren't always just giving him, you know, compression. A lot of them were coloration. But there was a lot of stuff going on. And then, of course, other things were malted, meaning multiple outputs were created from one output to several channels. And across that would be different levels of compression, so you could parallel things. Drum buses, for instance, would be compressed on individual elements, then compressed as a group, but then there would be a parallel group of either the whole drum mix or elements pushed into it. My point is, it's not all on the master bus. That is the biggest, biggest piece of misinformation out there. Mastering engineers always get blamed for making things too loud. The reality is, is mastering engineers spend half their lives trying to get life out of a mix because what we are all doing, and many of us, you know, are guilty of, is compressing so much along the way that by the time it gets to the master bus, it is just folded in on itself. But that is essentially how you get your mix loud. It's not just going limiter on the mix bus, you know, because you do that. If you if you get a limiter on your mix bus and you, you squash it by about 60 dB worth of limiting so it comes out as a square wave, it might not sound that loud. I know that sounds like, what, Warren? No, because the energy in the track is from the individual elements, the compression applied on individual elements, then being grouped and then being compressed again. So take your drum group, for instance. You know, assign everything to a drum, drum group and then have a parallel on it that's more heavily compressed that maybe just comes up underneath. Then take those two groups and feed them into one and then compress them and limit them. It doesn't have to be unbelievably aggressive, but just that sequence will seemingly make those drums just feel bigger and badder and just like more slamming. You don't have to go nuts and square wave everything, but it's that parallel, that serial and parallel compression that makes it happen. What do I mean by that? Well, things like bass guitars, vocals work really nice with serial compression. And then so you have different compressors with different characteristics, different sounds 
Like traditionally when I recorded the vocal, I would take a 160 VU and go into an 1176. They sound very different to each other, but serial compression of those two together gave me a very fat sounding, big, massive vocal sound that just sit really beautifully in the mix. It's really that. If you're asking the secret of how to get your mix to, to be loud and proud without it sounding square waved on the master bus, it is the individual elements leading up to the master bus being treated in a way that they're all big and bold and make a statement. And then of course it's judicious use of EQ, making sure that things fit together without doing too much EQ. Another mistake we all made, I still make many people still make, is getting a little too aggressive on EQ, of maybe too much low passing, too much high passing. It's important to low pass and high pass. It's really important to do that, but it's to get rid of extraneous stuff that you don't want. It's not to hollow out a sound so it's so tiny. So use it judiciously, get in there, sculpt it, be mindful that it's the crossover between instruments that starts to glue it together. So electric guitar, yeah, you don't really need much below 150 or 100 hertz. Of course you don't. You don't need much, but don't take it out entirely. If you want to high pass it gently out of the way, it's still going to be beautiful if it's got some 60 to 80 just, just low in that guitar sound. But it doesn't need to be loud. But you want a little bit of that to glue it together with the bass, which wants to have a lot of 80 to 100 and be, yeah, here it is. But it's also happy to have some 60 in there. But the 60 in the bass doesn't want to be louder than the 60 in the kick. So it's not a case of like creating a jigsaw puzzle of high and low pass stuff. It's gentle high and low passing. So there's crossover between different instruments and it will seemingly glue things together. So judicious use of EQ, making sure that you don't overly EQ things, lots of serial compression, but not like aggressively grabbing anything dramatically, just enough to get everything to start to feel like it's really coming to life and present. But at the same time, remember, if you want that big loud and upfront mix, you're going to be fighting with space. So make sure you use reverb in just the right way and delays just to make sure that things might be loud, but they're also not placed so that everything is like, oh, in my face, it's so loud. Because that is not going to make the mix feel loud as such because you don't want to turn it up because everything is just screaming at you. It is definitely a case of balancing everything out. Getting every instrument to have energy and feel full but at the same time, not every instrument pushing at you at once. There are genres and there's styles of music, which is quite nice to have everything hit you over the head, but not everything. I think in some EDM, some really over the top aggressive pop um, and some metal, it is a competition to get everything to be slamming at you. But I think ultimately good modern sound and music wants to take all of those elements but balance them in a way that sounds great. I don't know the genre that you, you, you do, but you're, when you talk about pumping, it's because that compression, it, everything is being applied too late. You need to apply the compression earlier on on individual elements so that when you get it as a whole, it's more controlled, it feels bigger. So how do you do it? How do you get your mixes to sound loud without sounding limited and crushed and distorted? Let's have a conversation about that. Please leave some of your comments below. I love talking about this. The second question here, I think, sort of ties into that one. How do you use a limiter? I think it's a great question is because I, of course I use limiters. Everybody I know and respect uses limiters, but we use them at the end of a chain. Okay, you're all going, oh, okay, that sounds obvious. Well, what I mean is like, they're not a last resort as such, they kind of are, but they are, I don't want to ever use a limiter too aggressively. So if I'm trying to control dynamics in a vocal, for instance, I'm going to use gentle compression, like we were talking about earlier, maybe in series just to control it so it still breathes, but it's not as peaky. And then maybe, you know, there's the odd kind of fishtailing transient that I just can't control. That's where a limiter comes in. So I don't reach and grab for the limiter early on. I love limiting, but I use it at the last resort at the very end of the chain, just to control things that I couldn't control in a far more gentle way. It is a great tool, of course, in mastering to get ultimate volume.
but really it will maybe give you an extra half a dB of like smash you over the head at the very end. If you're getting into a point where you're limiting at three to four to five, six dB, that's, unless you've got the cleanest sounding, most incredible limiter in the world, that's not a smart way of working. You need to be controlling that before you get there. One to three dB of limiting is, is, is a maximum I've ever really used. I will put an L2 on a mix or something equivalent to, to that, depending on which company, you, you know, which limiters you have by which company. But ultimately, I don't want to be seeing any more 3 dB maximum of limiting on my master bus. And that's only in very extreme circumstances. And it would have to be on just controlling a transient. Most of the time I'm dancing around like zero to one, one and a half dBs worth of limiting. That really gives me the best results. So when you say, how do you use a limiter? I use it at the very end. I use it just to control the peaks, the transient peaks. I need all the compression to come in there and use it at the very end. And if you're asking about any technical stuff, most limiter plugins are dumb. And I like that. Like for instance, the Waves L2 is stupidly simple. I love it. You just pull down the threshold. You've got the output here and that is it. And you can set the attack and release, but ultimately there's auto functions on most of these, which are pretty phenomenal. And I try to be careful about how I set the attack and release because I don't want to influence the way you hear the song. If it's set really super short, it can make everything go. It can exaggerate the on offness of it. I liked it to immediately grab and then control those transits. Best thing to do, open up, get your L2 or whatever limiter you have, try it on your master bus. As soon as you start to hear it really doing too much, see if you can control everything going in. You don't want to be doing over 3 dB worth of gain reduction, except in a couple of instances. Most of the time, zero to one, one and a half is beautiful at the end of a mastering or master bus mix bus, whatever you want to call it, chain. What do we have here? It's Christmas in July. I had to think about what month it is. Doing all kinds of things like using the scissors around the wrong way. I'm excited. What is it, what is it, what is it, what is it? People make money on unboxing videos, don't they? I'm not going to do, not gonna be able to do that. Look at that. Well, this tells you who it is. It's Baxendale, our good friend, Scott Baxendale who, as you know, does all the harmony um, conversions. Well, he told me about this particular guitar. I am a fan of semi-hollow, I suppose thin lines, that kind of guitar. You probably noticed I have a few, the PRS is like that. Well, he has one as well. And this is it. And I'm having a hard time getting it out. Well, that's a good sign. Eric's help, Eric's coming in to help. <laughs> I'm really excited about this. I've seen it in photos, but I've not seen it in real life yet. Very excited. Wow. There's the headstock, Baxendale. He makes such beautiful guitars. I mean, it's Telecaster-ish but I love this cutaway here. I love this finish. Absolutely gorgeous. He's a really amazing master craftsman. Scott, you rock. <laughs> I don't know what this is. I'm going to have to look it up later. Absolutely gorgeous guitar. Chambered. 
Beautiful. Thank you, Scott. You absolutely rock. Do you have any tips for making your mix translate from headphones to speakers? I mix primarily on headphones as they are the flattest monitoring I can currently afford. I can make my mixes sound good in headphones, but they don't ever sound as good on speakers. I think that's why things like Sonar Works do well and why people buy that because of this. What you're telling me is like you can make your mixes sound good on the headphones that you use. Now, many headphones have huge low end boosts. The blues I use have a really big fat low end, more than I would get on speakers, but I'm used to them. So I use them to sort of check the low end. However, the new Austrian audio I've been using over the last couple of weeks are the opposite. They're very flat down the low end. There is not a boost in the low end and they have a very pronounced mid range, which I'm actually enjoying because it's almost like listening to like a really good sounding pair of NS10s where I can work on the mid range. So I find I've been doing some more fun stuff with the Austrian because of that, because of the detail on the mid range. However, they are completely different headphones. Meaning if I mix to make them both sound the same, they won't translate to speakers, will they? If I take my Austrian audio and mix the low end so it is beautiful and fat and massive, I'll put it on a pair of Genelex or any hi-fi speakers or, or more, more importantly in the car and the speakers will go, <laughs> they will just be massive low end and I'll come running in here and I'll say what you're saying. I will say, I can't make it sound as good on speakers as I do in my headphones. My point is, is you've got to understand your headphones. So take music that you love and that you know and play it on speakers in various different systems and listen to it a lot and get used to how music that's well recorded sounds great, sounds in that room. Then listen to that same music with your headphones on. And if the low end is blowing up or non-existent in your headphones, you've got to mirror it. It's as simple as that. If you've got something you trust, you've got to mirror it. So have it as a reference track inside of your session or tracks, plural, get like four or five, maximum like six really good songs that you love the recording on and stick it in your session and listen to each of those while you're monitoring and mixing your own mix. Get a reference point. So you can always go back to a song you love and that you know sounds great and on speakers and you can listen to it and go, that sounds phenomenal. Then put your mix on and go, oh wow, my mix has too much bass in it compared with the other one. But the other one sounds a little bass light, meaning the really well mixed, well mastered track has a good balance of bass, but your headphones are adding or subtracting the low end. That's really the secret. You need to use reference tracks until you're familiar with your headphones. And then you need to reference those tracks in other environments so you can compare. So wherever you go, take your mix and mixes by other people and listen to it in that environment. Sit in the car, listen to your mix, and then listen to mixes that you love, that you know translate, that you know people love, and see how that sounds in your car. Go to some a friend's house, listen on their stereo system, on their whatever they listen to, on their computer speakers, listen to your mix, listen to music that you love. Essentially, what you need to do is you need to find a place of comfort where you know how things sound, and you can replicate that. But the best way, the number one way I can say when you're using headphones or even speakers in a room you don't know is to listen to reference track that you understand. It might be that you don't have that yet, but go out and find like six songs. For me, Woman in Chains to this day is still one of the greatest mix songs ever in the history of mixing. And I can put that on in any great room in the world. I did it at Focal's room with their uh, Gra uh, Grand Upo uh, Utopia speakers and listened super loud in that beautifully acoustically treated room with those beautiful speakers and it brought me to tears. There's a moment where I'm listening to Elgar and I'm crying in that room because I'm sitting there and this is my favorite music recorded beautifully, mixed beautifully in one of the best sounding rooms you're ever going to be in in your life. And I loved it because it was music I know, I love, reference tracks, everything. Create that for yourself. Find those songs. Take those songs that you know and love and you know well, put them into your session and use them as reference tracks against your mixes. Match how they sound on the low end in particular in your headphones. 
what a wonderful Friday this has been. Thank you everybody who's stuck around this week and left comments. I love reading the comments and the questions below. If you've got any answers to these questions, if you, whether you agree with me or you have different ways of doing them, I'd love to know. This is why we have such an incredible community because everybody helps each other out. So keep doing that. If there's, if there's better ways to do things or different things you've experienced, please let us know. Have a marvelous time recording and mixing. I really appreciate you all. Speak to you all again soon. See you next week. Mm -hmm.